let's see, this week we're dealing with uh, the spirit of prophecy. Last time we called it the Lord's guidance, but it's, uh, the subject is the spirit of prophecy. Now, before we get into the actual study, I found some old Bible studies put together by <clears throat> Mary Walsh. I don't know how many of you know about her. Doesn't look like any of you know that name. She, she's she's old, back in the forties. <laughs> she uh, was a Roman Catholic nun, and she left that church and became a teacher at Pacific Union College. And uh, she was a, a tremendous person. Uh, she was a real force to contend with because she knew the history of the Roman Catholic Church and she knew the theology inside and out. And so when anything came up, she knew right where to go in the Bible to meet all this. And uh, I found a series of studies that she did. And they're really uh, fantastic studies because they not only teach Adventism, but they teach it from the point of view of somebody who came out of Catholicism and is meeting specific things from the Catholic point of view. And uh, I looked up today what she did with the Spirit of Prophecy, and her introduction is so fantastic, I just want to read it to you. <laughs> and uh, just go through how she introduces the subject. In his sinless state, man talked face to face with his Creator with no shadowy curtain between. When sin entered, this method of communication ceased. In order for God to keep in touch with the human family and make known the plan of salvation, a system was devised. The Holy Spirit was God's divine agency through which he worked to reveal his will to the human family. And then there's a quote from Second Peter that we'll use later. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. These holy men not only spoke, but they wrote what was communicated to them. These writings have been in the providence of God preserved, and they have constituted the great spiritual guidebook for the church all down through the ages. The sacred canon bears the divine credentials. Its study reveals the operating power of the Holy Spirit upon the heart. Its predictions, unity, endurance, and towering above all else, its transforming power to change and reshape the life give conclusive evidence of its inspiration. When the canon of the Holy Scripture was closed, and we must admit the Bible is complete and nothing is omitted that is needful for our salvation, the Lord did not cease to communicate to His people. The medium of communication is needful to the end of time. Therefore, God placed the greatest of all spiritual gifts in the church, the gift of prophecy, to edify, unify, strengthen, and uphold His church. The work of a prophet is designed to expose sin, correct wrongs, instruct in regard to church difficulties, entreat, encourage the faithless, bring hope to the despairing, and to shed light upon the scriptures. There never was a time in the history of the church when she needed the spirit of prophecy more than she does today. The Lord is perfecting his people and getting them ready for translation. This cannot be accomplished without a human instrument through which the Holy Spirit can speak. Indeed, it would be tragic if God could not still communicate with His people through a prophet. For centuries before Christ, the church had the Old Testament scriptures. They contained all the truth that was necessary to salvation. Now, I don't know about you, but that thought alone is worth that introduction. <laughs> The Old Testament contains everything a person needs for salvation. That's not what the churches teach today. <laughs> when the 27 books of the New Testament were written under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they did not in any wise weaken the force of the Old Testament scriptures. <laughs> Another fantastic thought. But shed light upon them nor was it in the mind of God for the New Testament to supersede the Old Testament. 
The writings of the spirit of prophecy in the remnant church are not to replace or annul the Bible, nor are they an addition to it. Ellen G. White states very clearly the object and purpose of his write, her writings. And then she quotes from volume 2, page 605 and following. The written testimonies are not to give new light, but to impress vividly upon the heart the truths of inspiration already revealed. Man's duty to God and to his fellow man has been distinctly specified in God's word, yet but few of you are obedient to the light given. Additional truth is not brought out, but God has through the testimony simplified the great truths already given and in his own chosen way brought them before the people to awaken and impress the mind with them, that all may be left without excuse. And I won't read the rest of it, but that's enough of that introduction where that was the understanding of the spirit of prophecy back in the 40s. That's the way we should still be saying it. <laughs> it was the way I first understood it. <laughs> and it surprises me today to see people saying they're investigating to see whether the spirit of prophecy is is uh, authoritative or whether it's just pastoral or and all this stuff people talk about. <laughs> the gift of prophecy is God talking to his people directly through a human. And like she said, it would be tragic if God's true church didn't have that. <laughs> so let's see. Let's go into our Bible reading with the person that you're dealing with now to introduce them to this subject, because this is going to take a couple of times. This time we want to hit the Bible version of what the gift of prophecy is. And then next week we'll get into how it operates in the remnant church. Okay? So, when you're talking to the person, you want to clarify to them that Adam and Eve talked to God face to face. They're the only two humans that ever did that. <laughs> Every other human has had to have some sort of a medium to work through. Now, we have, of course, the hope that we will someday talk to God face to face ourselves. It will happen again. But for now, no one talks to God face to face. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, God had a whole new problem to deal with. How will he now communicate with human beings? He can't talk to them face to face. <laughs> okay? So that's a problem that Adam and Eve gave him. How does communication occur now? Well, uh, God, of course, is never caught by surprise. He will y use messages to communicate with mankind. And in order to have messages, you have to have messengers. So that's the first important clue that we have in this study, that God must have messengers. Now, you, are, of course, know about the spirit of prophecy, but think about this for a moment. If every human being is a sinner, how is God going to find a human to talk through? <laughs> because the only ones that he can talk through at this level are holy people. So here's his first problem. He's got to have holy people in order to communicate to everybody else. Now, I don't know if you see the ramifications of that. The very fact that this problem was introduced to God through sin means it in no way stopped the program of having holy people. <laughs> no matter what anybody says, the plan has always included holy people. <laughs> All right, so, so with these little thoughts, 
Let us turn to Revelation 1, verse 1, and let's begin working our way through this subject. It's a very familiar scripture, but we need to tie it in to what it's saying about this subject, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, probably in your Bible, just above that is a contradiction. It says the revelation of St. John. <laughs> Well, it's not the revelation of St. John. It's the revelation of Jesus. That's what it says right in the text. John didn't make that title up there. Somebody else did. <laughs> All right. So it says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants. So right here on the, in this first verse, we see that the spirit of prophecy, and we won't use the word a lot here, but all the revelations that come from God through this gift to his church are through Jesus Christ. Okay? So some of us may have to align our thinking. The spirit of prophecy is not Ellen White. She's the medium, the human medium, yes. But it's the revelation of Jesus. It's the revelation of God through Jesus. So this is about God. This is Him communicating with the human race. And the Bible says right there, through Jesus, it was given to Him to do that. Okay, 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse 10 and 11. In verse uh, 10 it says, Of which salvation, is talking about the people in the past uh, and so forth. It says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Now, obviously, they knew about the grace, didn't they? All the Old Testament prophets were in that grace. That's not what the churches teach. They were in grace, and they were telling us we would someday get it too. <laughs> so that's what the prophets did. Verse 11, searching. Remember, all these Old Testament prophets, they were searching diligently. It says, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them. Now, if that isn't the gospel, I don't know what is. <laughs> it says, all these prophets had the Spirit of Christ in them. When it testified before and the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So they not only received information about what would happen someday, they were having the experience of Jesus Christ. They were Christians. And this may not impact us so hard, but when you tell that to a person who's been educated by all these different churches out there saying there were no Christians before the cross, they were all Jews. <laughs> That's not what the Bible says. <laughs> they were Christians. They had the Spirit. And what Spirit does it say it was? The Spirit of Jesus. Okay? And they were inspired by that Spirit to know what God taught and to write and to teach and all the rest of it. Bible's very clear in this scripture that it was Jesus that was in them. All right. So with these two scriptures then, we want to know the spirit of prophecy is through Jesus. The Son. There are other scriptures, but these two are enough for this study. All right. Let's go see what a prophet is. 1 Samuel 9, 9. Says before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come, let us go to the seer. <laughs> okay? For what is now called a prophet, before time was called a seer. All right, so in the old days, before. Samuel here and here. 
They were called seers, and that's a very good terminology. See, from God, so you, he can say it to you, but that's what a prophet is. Okay, Amos 3, 7 is probably one of the keynote uh, scriptures in Adventism. Amos is, I mean, uh, yeah, Amos is a little hard to find. It's Daniel, uh, Hosea, let's see here. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, then Amos. Little teeny books. In Amos 3, 7, this is one you will want to memorize. This is one of those. There's one little scripture in just about every subject that if you can get a hold of, you'll have a package. Okay, 3, 7, it says, Surely the God, God will do nothing, but that he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. There are some groups out there who use this scripture and they are really shocked when you can quote it to them. They didn't think anybody knew it except that. <laughs> yeah. So you get this one under your belt. This is a good one. For the last days, there are going to be a lot of people who claim to have the prophetic gift. This is going to come, become a big deal. This is a scripture you'll want to have at the tip of your fingers. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but that he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. All right, since we're by Hosea, let's back up there a couple books. Let's look at that. Hosea 12, 13. By a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet was he preserved. Okay, so prophets are very important people in the scriptures. <laughs> the ones who hear directly from God. Uh, this is all done by a prophet. All right, let's go to Second Chronicles 20, 20 and see who really gets the benefit of this. We'll be looking at just the last part of that verse, actually. But we'll read the whole verse. It says, They rose early in the morning. They went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in Jehovah your God. So shall you be established. Believe his prophets. So shall you prosper. That is a heavy-duty Adventist scripture. Okay. Believe in Jehovah. And if you really believe in the real God, and he has told you how he does things, believe his prophets, and you will prosper. Proverbs 29 18 Proverbs uh, 29 18 where there is no vision the people perish where they have no spirit of prophecy they have a problem in other words if you can imagine what state Christianity is in today because they don't have the gift of prophecy. It says, Well, there is no vision of people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So you'll notice, they go together. <laughs> when, when a church does not teach keeping the law of God, they can't have the spirit of prophecy because God won't give it to them. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? Just for you, for your notes, but not part of this study. They're not ready for you. Over there in Lamentations 2, verse 9, it says that very same thing. It says, there is no more law. Therefore, the people have no vision from God. It says it the other way, so you can't miss it. They, they have messed around with God's law, so he cuts off the spirit of prophecy. Is it any wonder 
that some of us in our own midst don't believe in the spirit of prophecy. I wonder why. <laughs> Bible is very clear why. Those people are not law keepers. Even though they're members of the church. All right, so how does it work then? Let's uh, start a new little section here. Numbers 12, 16. Oh. I'm sorry. That's not right. What did I do here? 12. 6. 6. I don't know where I got that other number in there. 12, 6. I caught myself doing it this morning. This morning I was writing a scripture and I wrote it backwards. <laughs> and I looked at that and I said, how did that happen? <laughs> I'm getting like, what's his name? Bill Cosby. He goes around his house looking for his glasses and they're up on his head. <laughs> Something happens, he says, after your age, 55. <laughs> Okay, Numbers 12, 6, it says, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, Jehovah, will make myself known unto him in a vision. I will speak unto him in a dream. So God speaks to the prophets in visions and in dreams. That's, that's enough for, for right now. There's more to that, but we'll just leave that right there for now. Daniel 7, verses 1 and 2. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told us some of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. So Daniel's telling us how it works. He had a vision. He had a dream. And Daniel has two different kinds. He has visions, which he sees in his head, and then he has... Uh, Another kind of vision, mare, where he's looking at something. And that word mare is important when you get to talking to people who know something about the Bible. Because Daniel had a mare when he was dealing with the 2300 days. He, God did not give him a vision in a dream. Yeah. yeah. Daniel 9, yeah. Mare? Oh, M A R E H with a little slash in the middle. That's, that's not important for right now. That's, uh, that's extra for you to remember. And uh, don't look at Strong's Concordance for this because he missed it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so you have to watch some of the sources even. But in the Hebrew, it's there. All right, continuing. Um, verses 1 and 2 we did. Let's go now to Acts the 10th chapter, we want to read the whole thing there. We want to notice something. In this chapter, we have Peter dealing with a Gentile. And of course, Peter was a good Jew, and he didn't want to talk to this Gentile. He didn't want to have anything to do with him because he would be unclean then. And God had to come to him to show him not to call those Gentiles unclean. <laughs> But notice the way Peter says this. Chapter 10, verse 3. This is Cornelius now. It says he saw in a vision. Well, here's a Gentile having a vision. <laughs> so I guess that it's not only Jews that have them. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying to him, Cornelius. And then he looked. And an angel of God is talking to this non-Jew. That's pretty impressive. At least to a Jew, that would be very impressive. Okay, going down to verse 9. 
On the morrow, as they went on their journey, drew nigh to the city. Peter, oh, now we have Peter here. Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry. He would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw. Okay, there's the key word. He saw. This is a word that John uses over in, over, uh, in the Revelation. He says, I saw, I saw, I saw. Well, here's Peter. He saw. <laughs> So, God is showing. These are seers. <laughs> God is showing them something. Now, this is just for you. This is not part of your study. So, you see how consistent this is. When Ellen White wrote, and people have criticized her for this. When Ellen White wrote, she wrote based on what God showed her. She was a seer, too. <laughs> so he showed her. For example, he showed her what was happening with Mary, the Scots, and all of that. He showed her. She saw it. She saw the tower. She saw everything. And then when she went to sit down to write it, all of a sudden she realized she had a problem. I don't know when that happened. <laughs> God didn't give her a date. <laughs> she just saw it. <laughs> so she could describe it perfectly, but had no idea where to put it. <laughs> so for that, she had to go read history. She had to go find, there it is. <laughs> and then she'd read the history. She said, well, that man had a pretty good insight into that. That's just about what God showed me. His language is pretty good. I'm going to use that. <laughs> No, she only used it because it said what she saw. She didn't use it to have something to say. <laughs> but the fact is, a lot of the history that she wrote, she had no idea where it belonged. <laughs> God inspired her, but he didn't give her dates. <laughs> okay? So we have to know that about how inspiration works and how God deals with prophets. He shows them things. But sometimes they have to do their homework to find out what to do with it. <laughs> okay? There are all kinds of conservatives among us who criticize Ellen White for that, for writing stuff that she got from someplace else. Well, she didn't get it from someplace else. She just used their language because it said what she saw. <laughs> okay, continuing now. Uh, Peter then saw, John saw, these are easy. Revelation 4.1, Revelation 5.1, Revelation 6.1. John says it. Each one of those places. I saw. I saw. I saw. So this is, this is the way it works with prophets. They see, whether in a dream or a vision, or God puts something in front of them to actually see with their eyes, an appearance. That's what the word mare means, appearance. Sometimes God communicates through angels. I don't know if you have run into that statement in Spirit Prophecy where it says, angels sometimes take the place of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, if they speak on behalf of Christ, that's not a problem. See? Okay, so in Genesis 18... To me, that's kind of an interesting place because in Genesis 18, Abraham is involved. But there come to him not one, not two, but three angels. <laughs> three angels! <laughs> um, verse 16. Okay, it says, the men rose up thence, looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. Ah, oh, let's see, where does it say? The three, I come down my eyes and picking up. You're going to have to read that chapter to figure out the, where it says the three. But there are three in there. Verse two, okay, I didn't have my page turned. Yeah, three men stood by him. Okay, there. So here's a three angels message of a type to Abraham. <laughs> okay. All right, let's continue here. Daniel 8, 16. C. 
16 and 17. Here's where you can put your note on Marais. I heard a man's voice between the banks of Ulai, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the Marais. See, the normal word for vision is Hazon. That's what all the prophets get, is Hazons. But Daniel doesn't get one of those here. He gets a mare. Where is the mare? It's in verse 13. It says, I heard one saint speaking, another saint said to that one, how long, and so forth. Daniel is actually seeing this. This is an appearance. This is not a dream he had. This was placed in front of him so he could look at it and listen to them. And it's called a mare. That kind of a vision, an appearance. Now this is important, not for this study, but sometime you might have somebody saying, chapter 9 has nothing to do with chapter 8. Well, in chapter 9, when Gabriel is told to make Daniel understand now, the vision, the word over there is mare, it's verse 13. It can go to no other place in the Bible. That's the only thing Daniel didn't understand was the 2300 days. And so chapter 9 is an explanation of part of the 2300 days. Scholars today refuse to believe that, but that one word does it. I think they're probably all going to Strong's Concordance and they can't find it. <laughs> it's not there. <laughs> okay. Uh, in chapter 9, verse 21... They said, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. He informed me and talked with me and said, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee uh, skill and understanding. Well, the only thing that Daniel didn't understand was the 2300 days. Verse 23, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, I am come to show thee, thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter, and consider the marae. There it is. <laughs> now Daniel knew exactly what to think about as soon as he heard that word. <laughs> consider the marae. Yeah, the 2300 days, I didn't understand that. <laughs> so there's the link. But the point for us here is, in English, the word is vision. God reveals truth to the prophets by showing them things. Okay? Uh, in Exodus 3, we find another way. A very famous encounter between Moses and the burning bush. Exodus 3, verses 1 through 6. Okay, to get to the, to the core of it, in verse 4, Moses has been attracted by this burning bush that wasn't being turned to ashes. I wonder what's going on here. Verse 4, when Jehovah saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, the voice of God. With some, God talks to them. And they can hear him talking. And here is Moses hearing his name said by God. Twice. Uh, I'm sorry. Verse, verse 2. Oh, okay, right. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the midst of the flame, a fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, the bush did not consume. It says the angel of the Lord. Yeah. Well, who would that be? <laughs> That's the Spirit of God. That's Jesus Christ. That's what it said in Peter. The Spirit of God which talked to these people in the past. We put the scriptures together. This is Jesus talking to him. Okay? And later there's no question about Jesus being in the cleft of the rock and so forth. All right. Um, Acts, the ninth chapter, verse 3. Another very familiar place. But we're dealing with people who may or may not have a lot of knowledge about the scriptures. You need to guide them step by step like this. And I don't know about you, but it always refreshes me to see the scriptures line up again. <laughs> I mean, it always does something to me to know it's really there, that way. <laughs> 
Acts, the ninth chapter, verses uh, 3 and following there. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. This is the Christian killer. He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul. Ooh, same voice. <laughs> Moses, Moses. Saul, Saul. <laughs> Samuel, Samuel, yeah. <laughs> That's the same voice. How come we make up stories? That's Jesus Christ. I don't know how we can ever get confused on these things. That's Jesus. Why should we think something else? It's his voice. Saul, Saul. Because, you know, Saul asked him, well, who are you, sir? He said, I am Jesus. <laughs> How can anybody get confused over that? <laughs> okay. So, the voice of God, and I'm saying it that way because Jesus is God. Some people may say other things to try to make it a different way. No. Jesus is God. He's always been God. He never ceased being God. Ever. That little baby was God. The man in the wilderness, that was God. Jesus is always God. When people say he gave away his God attributes, I'm sorry. They're really, <laughs> they're twisting a story. It's true, Jesus did not do things as God on the earth. He did them as a man, but he was God. He never gave it away. He could have, well, the Bible says, doesn't it? <laughs> he could have laid everything waste to God in his way. He had the power. That's God. He could have called 12 legions of angels anytime. <laughs> he was God. As a matter of fact, the biggest temptation Jesus had that you and I will never know anything about was when he got in trouble <laughs> to do something about it as God. <laughs> he had to hold that back and not use it. Well, if that was such a big deal for him not to use it, he had to have it. How can anybody say he didn't have it anymore? He laid it down, they say. Philippians, the second chapter. No, that's not what he laid down. He laid down the exercise of it. He didn't lay down the power. <laughs> got to stay real here. Keep the whole thing together. I'm amazed at some of the things that we as Seventh-day Adventists have done to ourselves in the last few years in the name of reforming the church. <laughs> that's not reform, that's deform. I'm sorry. All right. There are false prophets. That's an interesting terminology, isn't it? False prophets. A person is willing to accept that in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, they're not quite so sure because that leads to some place. If you have a false prophet in modern times, it's just possible there's a true one. Because <laughs> you can't have something false if you don't have a real. <laughs> All right, false prophets. It's not, not a new thing. First Kings, the 18th uh, chapter, verse 19. We know the story. Elijah out there all by himself. I don't know if you've ever stood up to two or three people at the same time. That's not a fun thing to do. <laughs> Elijah was standing up. What does it say here? Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450. And the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. 850 false prophets. <laughs> Can you imagine what that would look like if they were sitting in here? <laughs> They'd just about fill this place up. 850 prophets. 
And Elijah, facing them with no other human in sight, and he even thought he was alone. That's a lot of false prophets. Matthew 7. Well, let's see, I have to be sure of this. Matthew 7. Fifteen, yeah, there it is. Verse fifteen. Now, whenever I read this scripture to teachers, and I mean teachers who are out there to say that they're right, no, it says, "Beware of false prophets." This is Jesus talking. And if there wasn't a problem, he wouldn't have said it. <laughs> okay, beware, beware. Of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. They look good. But inwardly they're ravening wolves. Read the next text. Keep reading. You shall know them, yeah, by their fruits. Do men gather thorns or figs or thistles? So every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Um, eat fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit, so forth. My mind is spinning with things I've just read. I've, I can't get into that right now. I've got to stay here. <laughs> These scriptures bring to mind so many things to me. All right. Uh, Matthew 24, 11. I'm trying to find a way to touch one person who's telling me that deception is not a problem. Only scaredy cats are worried about being deceived. Of course, someday he's going to realize how deceived he is in saying that, but, <laughs> but for now, we've got to find a way in there. And Jesus is one of those people who says about deception. 24... 11, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Now, these false prophets are going to have an audience. They're going to be heard and they are going to be believed. I mean, we could start listing books that you can buy today at the Christian bookstores. <laughs> And the people that believe those things, it's, it's just amazing. They believe what these people write in those books. And they go to the movies and all the rest of it to see the same stuff. It's just an astonishing thing to me that they can't see. Even if they didn't know the Bible, they should be able to see some of that. It just doesn't work. <laughs> they should deceive many. Second Peter... 121. Well, how do you tell if you're in front of a, a real prophet or not? Well, what's a false prophet look like? Let's see here. Second Peter 1.21. This is scripture you want to remember when people tell you nobody can keep the commandments of God, even Christians, or there's no such thing as a holy person. My Bible's full of scriptures that says something different. Chapter 2, verse 1, it says, There were false prophets also among the people. Oh, wrong place. I was verse before. Verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But what? Yeah, that's what it says, doesn't it? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. German word for spirit is Geist. That's where they came up with the word ghost. There's no ghost in the Bible. Spirit is the word here. Holy Spirit. Okay? King James language is kind of interesting in places. <laughs> what kind of men? Holy men. That's what God says. That's good enough. Holy men. First 
John, that's close. First John 4, verses 1 through 3. And this is one of my favorite scriptures. I have quoted this scripture at so many meetings. I'm talking about meetings where there are lots of speakers. <laughs> and when we're all up there talking one after the other, and you quote this scripture, they all start looking to see what's being said here. <laughs> I had one get downright mad at me because I said this in, in front of uh, an audience. Let's see what it says. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false Prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of Christ. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is the Spirit of anti-Christ. Whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now it already is in the world. Verse 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God hears us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby we know the Spirit of truth and the spirit of error. There's another little thing hiding in there. The prophets all agree with each other. That's one of the tests. When somebody comes along and says something different, I had to remind about six Mormon fellows of that. <laughs> they kept telling me they had a prophet. I said, really? Let's see where the agreement is then, because everything that's in here, they'll agree with. And the first thing they said didn't agree. I said, you know, there's a problem here. <laughs> because these all agree with each other. <laughs> Isaiah 8.20. Another one of those, get it memorized. They said they were going to come back the next week to prove their prophet was a real prophet. I said, okay, come back next week and do that. I'll be happy to see you. Uh, but know this. You're going to have to explain to me Isaiah 8, 20 first, and then we'll go from there. And they said, what does it say there? To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. <laughs> I said, your prophet better tell me about the law of God, that we are to keep it in Jesus Christ. They didn't come back. <laughs> they had their bishop with them that week, and he couldn't answer that one. <laughs> that one scripture. Get it memorized. It doesn't say to the law and to the testimony. If they don't speak that way, it's just because they don't know yet. It doesn't say that. Give them time. It doesn't say that. It says, well, I believe the other things that are true. It doesn't say that. It says, if they don't know about the law and the testimony of Jesus Christ, if they don't have that, they don't have information from God. There's no light in them. They're not qualified to be teachers. The prophets of God all agree. They all know that. To the law and to the testimony. Every prophet of God talks the same way. Jeremiah 23, 16, 17. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not of the mouth of the Lord. They say... Uh, still unto them that despise me, the Lord has said, you shall have peace. 
And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. See, that's the way we say it today is, Oh, that doesn't matter. Just believe in Jesus. Just, just believe in Christ. You don't have to believe what God said through his prophets. Read it in there. You have it different? Oh, what's the scripture? Jeremiah 23, 16 and 17. Yeah, 16 and 17. Jeremiah 28, 9. I better get moving. I've been taking too much time here. I want to finish this Bible reading with you. 28, 9. By the way, for your note there, I don't know if you had a note, a prophet is a reprover of sin. That's what a true prophet does. True prophets don't speak smooth things. True prophets don't come along telling you how good you're doing. A true prophet always sends arrows of conviction to your heart to lay you in the dust so that God will be your total dependent. People like to have only people around who just tell them smooth things. All right. In verse 9 it says, The prophet which prophesies of peace from the word of the prophet shall come to pass. Then shall that prophet be known that the Lord has truly sent him. A true prophet of God always is 100% accurate. Okay? That's an important one. 100%. That lets out Zarathustra. <laughs> that lets out well you make your own list of all the people who said they were prophets they weren't if they missed one time <laughs> all right uh, Matthew seven fifteen through 20 he said beware of prophets we read everything down to verse 19 every tree that bringeth forth good fruit is hewn down cast fire wherefore by their fruits you shall know them what kind of fruits is Jesus talking about in this little section a prophet is always beyond reproach you know when Ellen White died In one of the big New York papers, I forget which one exactly it was, but I saw the paper. <laughs> they, they have morgues of all these things, and I saw the papers. When Ellen White died, the, the paper said, after pages, full pages on her life and so forth, at the very end it said, whether she was a prophet or not, we can't say. We don't know that. But we can say this, she lived the life of a prophet. <laughs> See, even a secular newspaper knew there was a life you couldn't fault. A real prophet always leads people to holiness, always. John 17, 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. That's what a true prophet does. Brings the people together. Helps them to understand that they're supposed to press together. That they are not to be out there calling people names calling the church Babylon, putting tapes out to destroy confidence and leadership and all the other things that people can do that are against God, while at the same time saying, we're building up the church. No, that is not the way the Bible says it. Jesus teaches unity. That's what this 17th chapter is all about. That was his last prayer for his people to be one people. So, these things we have read in the Bible, it's time to ask the people a question. Are all these things still true? <laughs> because
because they have never heard of a church other than cults. They know about the cults out there. But they've never heard of a church that really deals with this subject the Bible way. Well, I will just give you the scriptures. We're running out of time here. I want this on the tape. Joel, the second chapter, verses 28 to 31, it talks about in the last days, the sons and daughters will prophesy. Okay? So, the, that prophecy must be fulfilled in Joel. In Acts, the second chapter, verses 16 through 21, there was a partial fulfillment. And Peter recognized it. He says, this is what Joel said. There's going to be prophesying, and it's happening now. So Peter recognized it. At Pentecost, they knew part of Joel had been fulfilled. But the question is, was that the end of it? Well, that's New Testament already, but was that the end? The most powerful section is in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, Verses 11 through 14. And this one you need in your Bible reading. Ephesians 4, starting with verse 11. He gave some, and these are the gifts that God has given the church. He gave some apostles. Well, nobody's going to argue with that. Some prophets. Uh-oh. <laughs> some evangelists. Some pastor teachers, the word and isn't really there in the Greek. Pastor teachers is one thing. Pastors are supposed to be teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. And in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro with all these doctrines and sleight of hands and all these things. Now, the important thing you want to get across here is that according to Paul, the New Testament theologian, he says God has given the gift of prophets to the church until we all come into the unity of the faith until we've reached the stature of a perfect man. And you just ask the people, <laughs> have we done that yet? <laughs> well, obviously not. Well, then we still need the gift of prophecy. And God promised it in His church until we get there. There's no place to go now. Now they're looking around. Who's got this? Who's got this? What is this? <laughs> All right. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 1, Paul, same author, says something very important that they're ready to hear now. 1 Corinthians 7 1. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say 7 1? 12 1. I'm getting myself. 12 1. Better write that correctly. Yeah, there it is. 1 Corinthians 12 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, and that's what this is. Spirit policy is a spiritual gift. Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Okay, there it is. As Christians, we are not to be ignorant on this subject. Paul says so. We're supposed to understand this. We're supposed to know what God said on this. It's important. Just in case you bump into a tongues person, you better read verses 4 through 6. There are diversities of gifts. There are actually 12 of them that God outlines. There are diversities of gifts of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, another discerning of spirits, another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work... Did you get the point? Tongues is only one gift among 12 of them that are in this list. And out of this list, tongues is a minor gift. Spirit prophecy is the top one, as he says later on in chapter 12, 13, and 14. 
Okay, so y y you have to measure who you're talking to to continue the reading in some of these. Um, Paul, in this little section, in verse 14, he gives an example here of why God has all those gifts and why one is not to override the others. For the body is not one member. You're not one big foot. <laughs> you have other parts. He says, it, so the church is the same way, that all these different gifts, they all have to be there. All right, let's wrap this up now. Uh, in uh, Lamentations 2.9, we quoted that, but didn't really use it in the study. When people trample the law of God, they have no more vision from God. The reason people don't have the spirit of prophecy is they don't teach people to keep the law of God. All right. Revelation 12.17 says that God's last church will be commandment keepers. Okay, Revelation 14, 12 says they are not only commandment keepers, they have the testimony of Jesus. And in 1910, it says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when you get this all together, commandment keepers are the only ones who can get the spirit of prophecy. And God's last church are commandment keepers. They have the spirit of prophecy. The people will understand this now, and they will be ready for next week's subject, which is how the spirit of prophecy operates in the Adventist church. We'll, we'll get over to Ellen White and the history of that, and to show biblically what, that she meets the Bible criterion. All right. Um, I think that's all you need for this particular study. You can wrap it up any way you wish. By this point, you can be asking the person, little questions about how they feel about these things and how their studies are coming along and how the Lord is dealing with them. Start getting some feedback from them and get them to talk about it. And if they haven't started attending church with you by this time, this is about the time you should do it because you've hit them with every major thing. You need to invite them to see what it's like to be around Sabbath-keeping people. It might be a shock the first time. I don't know. Uh, I really don't know anymore. In the old days, it was different because you could walk into church and not see one bit of lipstick, one bit of rouge, one ring. You could get, go in that church and not see one earring. I mean, <laughs> it used to be like Adventists. Today, you can walk into a church and it looks like you walked into a Nazarene church. A Baptist church or whatever. Now, there are some fine Christians in those churches, but they don't know about the standards that we have been shown. And I wonder who still talks about them. It's kind of a hard thing because when people hear standards, they say, oh, now you're into works. No, not if you're a Christian. <laughs> a Christian does works, not to be saved. They just do them. God wants us to be a, a peculiar people in this world. Not just to be strange, but because he's trying to get us to get outside of the way the world thinks. That's not easy. There are things everywhere to pull on us, to make us just like everybody else, because it, some of it looks harmless. I was reading a thing today. I think we're off the tape. I don't know. But I was reading a thing today. And he brought up Harry Potter. And I don't know if you know what Harry Potter is or not, but the world has gone crazy over Harry Potter. It's all about wizards and witches and whatever. <laughs> and the Catholic Church says, you give us your children, we'll get their whole family. <laughs> you give us your children, especially the early ones. Well, Harry Potter's got them. Yeah, the Catholic Church didn't have to do it. Harry Potter got him. This world is moving in ways we don't seem to recognize, and we need to begin thinking about it because Adventism, the real thing, is coming back again. And I wonder what's going to happen in our churches when a real Adventist church stands up and that other church stands up that says, no, we like it the way it is in the world. <laughs>
What's going to happen to us as a people? Well, I know one thing. The real Adventists aren't the ones who are going to leave. You can write that down. Jesus told us he's going to leave. He said the, the chaff is what blows away in the wind. And so when people leave Adventism for any reason, they're not the real ones. I've told that to some pretty serious people who think they were the good ones and that's why they left. No, I told him, you just failed the test. Ellen White tells us, our bitterest test is going to be our own brethren. I said, you just think about it. You left. You failed the test. <laughs> yeah, to stick it out, that's what's hard. Okay, let's have prayer. Father, we thank you that we have these opportunities. May the weight of all these scriptures come to us and show us that your word is flawless. It just keeps moving along and saying the same thing from any approach. That it's all through Jesus. That he is more than a conqueror. He is, has already won everything that needs to be done in terms of merit and conquering evil. And we are more than conquerors through him. Help us, Lord, to sense that we're not fighting anything new. Jesus is the one who does the fighting. We walk with him, and with him everything is done. Help us, Lord as we study the Bible, to not just be reading it for somebody else, but help us sense that you're speaking to us individually, that you want to tell us things, that you want to show us things that we've seen a hundred times, but now it's new. We thank you, Lord, that with this preparation, you can put someone in front of us, and we'll have something to say. We'll have an experience to talk about. And even though we know we ourselves are no better than anybody else, We'll be able to help someone. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. One high-level official of the United States State Department told me privately, and this is to a Seventh-day Adventist, here's the quote, religious freedom is a luxury we can no longer afford. That's the State Department. That's the highest level of government in this country the State Department, and they don't think religious freedom is what, something America can afford anymore. Is the great controversy happening or isn't it? I don't know about you, but a sentence like that tells me, I don't care what any scholar says from, from whatever school he came to, when he tells me Ellen White is wrong, guess who I'm going to go out with? <laughs> it's right there in history. Who would have thought the United States government people would be talking like that? At the United Nations, this statement, the worldwide trend as regards religion and belief is towards increased intolerance and discrimination against minorities. And we are one of them. That's what their religious liberty department says at the United Nations. The United States is saying it's necessary. They're saying it's a fact. Here's another statement. The world situation shows an overall rise in intolerance and discrimination against religious minorities and women in situations of extreme risk and an increase in religious extremism affecting all religions. Guess who we're going to be? She says so. Great Controversy, page 590. They're going to say, we are causing the problems in this world. We used to read those and say, well, someday, someday, hey, it's today. 
They just haven't put our name on the list yet. And if you want, pick it up in the newspapers. Here it is in the Review and Herald. <laughs> okay. God is building a people on this planet. You can't see them yet. But I really believe he has some here. He's building some right here. He's not allowing us to be together like this just to be, you know, blowing air. We're supposed to be catching this and deciding I'm going to be one of those, whatever it costs. Okay, I don't want to go into more areas right now. We will just spend uh, until the first talking about this way of looking at things and we'll start a different thing. I want to get back to some devotional things to show how Ellen White has told us how to measure ourselves as Christians. It's one thing to know you're a Christian, but then there's something we need to be doing, and we sometimes don't get the idea of it until we see it in print. <laughs> God has to t tell us. And I know that because in Volume 9, for example, she says it's the job of the pastor to teach the people how to work, what to do to give them opportunities, and all kinds of different things. In other words, we don't just all of a sudden think about this and do it. We have to get, have some instruction. And I think the Lord wants us to somehow get motivated here and get some ideas across. Maybe, maybe we can do some writing and share some ideas with each other, things we think we can do. You might be thinking about that. You know, not all of us can go put up a tent and start talking. <laughs> but we all can do something. We ought to be thinking, what is it I could do? Well, I could write a letter to so-and-so. Yeah, I could give a booklet to so-and-so. You know, things like that. So be thinking about it, and we'll talk about it as we go along here. All right, let's have prayer. Father, we thank you. You never blame us for anything. You love us. And it's the real love, the selfless agape love that wants to serve us. Help us to understand that you really are our Father. You're our creator, that you made us for a purpose, and you mean to see that purpose fulfilled. Help us to sense that we all have been trained to focus on things in this world, and we need to get past that. We need to hear your voice. We need to read the words you have written for us. We need to spend the time. We need to meditate. We need to be available. We need to be merciful and compassionate with people. We need to really want to serve. Help us, Lord, to sense during this time when people's attention is about Jesus coming, that he wants to come again. He's yearning to have himself revealed again on this planet through his people. Help us to know that we really are those people. It's not somebody else. Help us to know that whatever it takes, you're going to see it through. May we be willing. And if we're not completely willing, let us be willing to be made willing. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.